Did you get your gloves on? No. No? Looks like it. No. Okay. Well, hello, 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 everyone. Sorry for the wind noise. I live out in the desert, and very often there is wind everywhere. Uh, we'll do a walk around video later on this deal, but um, you can see I've got a little uh, new seat cover on, a little graphic graphic, just kind of make it a little unique. But today, what we're going to do is I'm going to do another long video. I've decided to do a long video. Uh, step beginning to the end on how to rebuild your KLX 400 slash DRZ 400 front forks and revalve them. I'm not going to stop the video. I'm just going to let it play. I'm not turning on music so people can hear me. And I'm going to go beginning to end. And you'll see what a struggle it can be sometimes. So let's go ahead and start out. Uh, first thing I like to do is to break well actually we're going to break these top bolts they should be 15 foot pounds when you put it back together most people really over tighten them uh, they're not easy to slide because we're going to want to loosen that top cap so we're going to do both sides here and actually i'm going to slow this down when i'm doing it without anything on no video just playing music i just get cranking and i really rip on it but I'm not going to do that now so you guys can kind of follow along a little better. Uh, there's some little jimmy rig stuff we're going to fix here. Stuff like a speedometer cable clamped. <laughs> it's my granddaughter. She wants to come out here and help too. So she's got her gloves on and she's going to be pulling all the rocks out of that. We'll have to go put them all back. That's okay. Hopefully you guys can see this is kind of a new setup. I don't have my homie Rojo here to help me film. Clip these zip ties out of here. Uh, let's see, we're gonna take off the brakes. Thank you, sweetie. Oh, we're okay. We're gonna take the brakes off of this bike so we can, oh boy. I'm going to take the brakes off so we can take the forks off. I don't know if you guys can see this okay. I hope you can. I, uh, I don't have uh, much time nowadays to set up cameras and get the audio perfect and everything. I figured it's better if I can just get this out there so you guys can have some, some direction. Take the brake caliper off. I'm going to be changing some things with this for sure. Maybe, maybe not. Got an idea. And you're going to take this off. <laughs> it's already loose. That's great. 12 millimeter clamp bolts. These should also be 15 foot pounds when you torque everything back together again. Come down, sweetie. Come down so you don't get hurt. She's getting into that climbing stage where she just wants to climb everywhere. You got this speedometer drive. You got to get out of the way. And what we're going to do is we're just going to get a little tap tap -a -roo. Take this off. And. Hopefully this bike will not come off the stand. There we go. Oh shoot, of course. Are you throwing rocks, honey? Got a little itchy there. Got to get this all the way out to get that off. Okay, no more throwing rocks. I'll have you sweep them up. And the tire's off. I'm gonna slide this back here and put it right there. Now I'm starting to get greasy. Uh, okay, we're gonna leave this tight for now. 
forgot to get something to get that off. That's usually a 17. And uh, try to be a little bit somewhat organized here just to save myself some time. This thing is such a mess. 11 sixteenths works as well. But just in case, I'll take the good old crescent wrench. I'm coming back, honey. You got a booger nose? Oh, you got snot all over your face. Yeah, it's a 17 or 11 sixteenths. And once you have that loosened up, you can loosen this up. Take the headlight clamp off. Ooh, she's already sliding. Okay. Let's take this. Don't think I need the rest of it. All right. Okay, so here's the fork. Hope you guys can see it. I'm gonna bring this build down a little bit more. Take my glasses off. Okay, now one thing we need. What do I do with it? Oh, I need to get, I need to grow under the foot. I've been saying that forever. Okay, we need a container to drain oil because the first thing we're going to do, take the top cap off. I'm not worried about clicker settings right now, it doesn't matter. And by the way, these things have been very harsh. So I'm really interested to see how thick the oil is, or if there's oil. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I don't always do it in this order. Oop, um, oh, it's got the stink. The stink of the old oil. But sometimes I'll do this in this order where I'll actually take... Let me get down here so you can see it. It's nut right there. It's a lock nut. Keeps the top cap on, and you gotta break it loose. Good, not overly tightened. Now this is not the Supermoto design. The Supermoto has a totally different fork. It's an upside down fork. I'm gonna set this aside, top cap. Spring. Oh, ho, ho, ho. this is nasty. I'm going to do this dump all in one shot. I don't know why it was so harsh. That does not look like thick oil. She can drain all the oil out of it. What's that little pin? Boy, I never do it like this. I'm making a huge mess. Don't forget that pin goes in the bottom. Okay, now we can drain. And when we drain, 
you kind of pump this rod back and forth to drain as much of the fluid out of it as you can. So far, I don't, that was not thick oil like I expected it to be. Um, so that's a little bit of a surprise. Can't stand everywhere I step making a huge mess. My son's over there replacing his crank position sensor. He uh, got himself another ride and he's getting ready to sell his Xterra. Okay, that's good. close enough. Okay, now we need a small screwdriver. Uh, we all have our favorites. That little guy right there is my favorite. And what we do is we hold this upright and you grab the screwdriver. Now most of the time when you're dealing with fork stuff is spent cleaning. It doesn't take a tremendous amount of time to rebuild these things if they're clean, but there's all kinds of cleaning time you have to do. And then this bottom, I'm quite lazy, as you all know, and I very often will just zip that baby off. Let's see, I think it's 20. Ooh, 21, right on the money. It's faster for me to do it this way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the air on. We got 90 pounds, that's probably enough. You can get whatever you need, bud. Make sure it's on all the way. The other thing you can do is you can kind of hold, what I do is I hold the cartridge inside and put a little bit of a band or a little bit of pull on it to keep it from twisting. Now you'll feel it. Usually you'll feel it come out, it's close. I felt it move. There we go. And then you pull that cartridge out. Sit it there. We're just going to do one at a time. And we'll get the rest of that out in just a minute. And then what you're going to do is you, you, I already took the clip ring out. So I got the outward seal, the clip ring, then inside is the inner seal. This is actually the dust seal. And you take your fork tube, just go blap, 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 like that in their part. There's your, the rest of your seals. Uh, this is gonna be your inner seal. And you have to pry this apart to get it off. And what you do is you look inside and if more than one third of the bushing is showing where it's done. And that, the, you can see the entire bushing there's a little bit of material left there, but pretty much the whole bushing width is shiny. That means it's, it's done. So I, I have new ones anyway. Uh, then you've got the outer, that, and then you've got the inner seal there. Now all this stuff is gonna have to be cleaned, but and one of the things that we do when once you get to this point is we are gonna revalve this thing. I'll show you about that in just a minute. Oh, I forget. You got this inner cone. And 
and we're going to lose a ton of fork oil here in just a second when I show you this. It's been all over. Um, I have kept damaged rebound rods. You can use that and you just balance it on the inside there. Out comes the base valve. So now I've made a huge mess. You have it disassembled, just like that, no big deal. And unfortunately, my parts washer motor pump died. So now I'm relegated to using brake clean. So let's spray a little brake clean on here. Going in. And here is the base valve. Now, I'm not talking a great deal. You guys have seen my videos before. That's actually not very tight, usually. I mean, there's some movement there. Normally, this is down tighter than that. I don't know why that's the case, but I already know what the valving specs are, but I'm going to show you how we're going to do this. So you can take your soft jaws, you can put a socket in there to hold it, or you can just use your soft jaws to hold it. Nice and stable. You can use a 10 millimeter wrench. Let's show you how to do that. That's probably the proper way. I got this little guy right here. That little guy right there. Let's use this little, this little guy. He's been bent up quite a bit. And you put that on the the nut there, and what you're going to do is you're, this is this is made out of aluminum. The nut is made out of steel. You can easily gall up the aluminum. So what you do is you just break it loose, and you just go back and forth, and chase the threads back into a threaded nut. Now they peen the endus, and it swages out the material, the 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 aluminum, and so it uh, that's what helps to hold it on. But what you can do is just back and forth the the nut just like this and it shouldn't require a lot of effort you shouldn't just get in there and just rrr, 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 take it off because that can mess up the threads you just go back and forth a little bit and chase them just like that and you'll find that at some point they'll they'll be kind of loose and then you can just back it off and what we're going to do is you're going to then lay everything out so you can evaluate it. First thing is the nut. Then you're going to have this little capture washer here that has a stepped section on it that goes down inside. You'll see here in just a second. You've got also got this spring. The spring goes on the outside of this retaining washer and all of that fits inside of this. So it kind of fits together like that. So that washer is floating. That's a kind of a rebound deal that allows the forks to rebound without resistance. So we're going to put all that in order. Washer, spring, oversize valve. And sometimes this, this is the piston. Sometimes that won't come off because the ends of this gets all messed up and it won't come off. So sometimes, sometimes you have to file the edges a little bit, but that's the piston. And then right here is all the valving. What you're going to do is you're going to take all that off and you're going to lay it out on the table in order like that. Hopefully you guys can see this. There's a little crossover right there. And I'm doing this just like I would do any other machine. 
Now this is an open cartridge design. And there's, where's my little fancy tool? There's one little spacer here, a couple little washers that I want to get up and off. They're just creating a little bit of space here. Sometimes they're hard to get off. Sometimes you have to get gravity on your side. Jeez. Had it separated there. Let's try that again. I had it separated and then. There we go. There we go. Now, usually before I move on any further, I clean this edge up. I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but I've got several different files. I usually will just hold it by hand. Just start to clean the edge up a little bit. Kind of round it, but you don't want to mess the threads up. You guys know how to kind of clean up threads, I think. You just want to take the burrs off. And sometimes I'll... You know how files are designed to cut one way and not the other way? Sometimes just for control, instead of cutting, I'll, I'll actually pull back. It gives me a little bit more control and it's a little bit less aggressive than going forward and it takes a little bit less material off. In the end you want it to be kind of smooth but and it will also be larger in diameter so I'll cut this way a little bit to try to make the diameter Check out my watch, people. That's minute stop. Minute watch. He made that watch for me. Custom. Can't remember the name of it now. It's the Duff Factor mod, I think. And it has a, it's made from two different watches. Got a sapphire dome in it. With a little bit of a blue hint. One of my favorite watches. Second only to the one that he gave me. Well, my, uh, orange monster. Anyway, you gotta take as much time as you need to to clean those threads up. I could be here a while. I've got smaller files and things I use sometimes. You're always gonna make sure those threads easily can be clean enough to thread this back on by hand. There we go, so we're, we're good. That threaded right on by hand. Okay, now the other thing is sometimes in doing that, it'll mess up that center hole. And if it does, take a drill bit that's a little bit smaller and put that drill bit in there and twist it and clean up and chamfer the inside edge of that hole. Now, uh, we didn't have to do that on this one. It's, it's fine. Um, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to get one of these little hose things. Man, my hands are all greasy. Did you find it, bud? Let me 
when you spray through this center hole, it should come out of these four bleed holes. So when you loosen the compression by adjusting that screw counterclockwise, all it does is drops a pin down to open up these holes and make them more open. So you just, it bypasses, the oil bypasses the shim stack. And to make it more firm, all you do is tighten that up, go clockwise with it, and it will close down that hole and force more oil through this shim stack. And what that will do is, is make it more firm. So uh, loosening your compression adjuster, all it does is create bleed, bleeds off pressure. That's all it does. Maybe look on the front of the engine. Maybe it's... What? Oh. Make sure your brakes are on and it's well blocked. Okay, then what we're going to do is we've got to come get my... So here it is. Come get my dial calipers. Charm was over here watching us work and talking for a little bit, but that's when you gotta sit down. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do. Now we're going to start talking about shims. I like to clean them all off, wipe them all off good. You don't like to leave fuzz on them, but we'll we'll get all that off when we redo the reassemble the stack. And as many of you have known before, I've talked about low speed compression and high speed compression. And low speed compression is in reference to fork low speed hits. That would be hitting the face of a jump, landing on the other side of a jump, going through a G out, um, Let's see, just anything where the fork speed is low, that is low speed compression. And the shims that control that are this big stack that's closest to the, ba to the base valve. And then you'll almost always see, not always, but very often you will see a small shim that separates a tapering pack, which tapering meaning large going to smaller, going to smaller, going to smaller, going to smaller, which is defined as the high speed compression and high speed compression are things that make the forks go fast, like sharp square edged hits, like rock gardens. Um, sorry, I gotta get these off so I can feel what I'm doing. Um, breaking bumps, um, just square edge stuff that's really hammering. And so I kind of prefer, my personal preference is, to have it a little bit more stiff on the low speed compression and then a little bit softer on the high speed compression so it's softer on the on the chatter and the high speed um, you know sharp edged rocks and bumps that you hit that really jar you and then but I like it to be firm when you're going there's a certain amount of firmness that I like when you're hitting the face of a jump or landing on a jump or hitting a G out or, or hitting the bottom of a hill to climb etc etc now I haven't pulled these out yet but I have ordered uh, shims because I already know what my first stack is likely to be um, well no not likely to be I know what it's going to be and um, so I pre-ordered my shims knowing that I I lent my shims out to a friend who is redoing his 950 and I told him take what you need and so he, he did, and the ones I need are 
I don't have enough of the ones that I need. So here's the low. Sp oh, they're both in there, I guess. I hope they're both in there. We'll see. I can see the shock shims, which are the bigger ones. And there's the smaller ones, so. Okay, so let's go ahead and this is where shim stacks go all over the garage floor. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, those are the small. And these ones are for the shock that I'll save for later. So here's how you measure them. You take your fancy little Harbor Freight uh, digital calipers out. We measure these in millimeters. So you zero out your dial caliper. I can tell my battery's getting low, but it'll be okay. You measure the diameter. These are 23.99. We just call it a 24. And you measure the thickness. That's 0.10 or tens. So we call that a 24 by 10. Now the inner diameter is a six, six millimeters. And most bikes are six millimeters. There are some older KYBs that actually have an eight millimeter shaft which is slightly larger, so you have to pull your stuff apart in order to know for sure. But we have one, two, three, four, five, six, 24 millimeter by tens. Now, I know I want to firm that up. I'm going to show you what I've, what I've ordered. Now, sometimes the shop won't have exactly what you want. That was the case with these guys. They didn't have 24s. Two, three, four, five, six. So they had one, two 24s. You're going to need one for each fork leg. And then they had 22s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 23s, which is close. 23 by 10 and 23 by 10. So I want to stiffen up the low speed compression. So I'm going to take these 24s, of which we have six, and I'm going to add one more, because I need one for the other fork leg. And I'm going to add two 23s, because I'm going to add, keep these other two 23s for the other fork leg. So now I'm firming that up by going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 24 by tens, and adding two 23 by tens. They just didn't have 24s. I'd have preferred to have nine 24 by tens, but instead I only have seven and two 23s. Ah, it's close enough. Now we're gonna talk about high speed compression. I got a bug in my ear, sorry. And This crossover, we're going to keep the same. And I'm going to go with a 24 by 10. This should be a 22 by 10. Yep, 22 by 10. They go every other one. This is probably a 20 by 10, which it is. Got a bug on me. This is probably an 18, which it is. 18 by 10. 16 by 10. Probably a 14, 14 by 15. Now let's see. Yeah, and this one's probably a 12 by, yeah, 12 by 20. So I kind of want to, let's see what I got myself here to remind myself. I've got it written down, but here's a 12 by 10. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch out the 12 by 20 with a 12 by 10. So that's going to soften it just a little bit because it's not as thick, which means I got to leave a 12 by 10, 12 by 10 for the other fork leg. Whatever you do to one, you got to do to the other. And then I should have an 11. Yes, 11 by 20. Let's see what I got here. I might have four of those. 11 
by 20. Got to see what this one is. 11 by 20. 11 by 20. Okay, here's where it gets kind of weird. So on the high speed, the faster you taper down, the softer it will be. The more shim stacks you have in there or the thicker they are, fly bugging me, the stiffer it will be. I want it to be more supple. So I change this to a 12 by 10 instead of a 12 by 20. And then you can create kind of what a, what's called a clamp, which is where you do a small, a very small diameter shim that is easy for the other ones to deflect over. That's what these little guys are right here. And they're at eight by 10. So these ones I got in case I decided that I wanted to firm it up later. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave those for now. And I'm gonna do two eights. I'm gonna get rid of this one right here. I think this was a 10. Yeah, or that's a nine, nine by 20. I'm gonna put these two eights by tens, which is gonna create a clamp and make it kind of flex over the, did I put two there? Sorry, I'm talking to myself. Which is gonna make this high speed shim stack flex over those two small ones easier. When you're on motocross bikes with the 47 millimeter uh, show of forks, their magic number is their 15 by 10. If you stack two 15 by 10s at the bottom, those forks turn into magic, just magic. Um, I'm, I'm kind of doing the same thing, but, but I'm going with a smaller one that these forks are different. And I'm gonna hope that that's not too soft. If it is too soft, I'm gonna keep these and I can, I can go back and stiffen it up a little bit. So that is the shim stack. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these two spacers, we're gonna put it back on like so. Then we reverse order them. We're gonna put the two eight by tens the 12, the 14, 16, 18, I think it's a 20, 22, do this without gloves guys, 24. That's your new high speed stack. Then we're gonna put the clamp, or the crossover, it's technically called a crossover, but and then you're gonna put the low speed stack, which is gonna be one, two, 23 by 10s. Then we're gonna go a 24 by 10, 24 by 10, 24 by 10, 24 by 10, another one, another one, and another one. And that's your new stack. And I'm gonna reproduce that same thing on the other side. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna clean this little baby. Boy, I make such a, I make such a mess. Get all the old nasty oil off of it. And one way you know which way it goes, people get confused sometimes, is that little cutout section right there. That's what this fits into. That always goes to the top. Bazinga. I'm gonna take this floating shim. It's gonna go on. And he's gonna wipe off the spring. Wipe this off. That is not a keeper. That doesn't go there. And then we're gonna really clean this nut because you don't want this nut coming off, as you can imagine. That'd be horrible. You'd have parts grenading all over inside your fork tubes. And you're going to uh, 
Loctite this. No, you don't use red Loctite. Yes, you use a medium thread locker. Uh, we generalize and say blue, but you all know that it's based on numbers. But now that that's clean, we know that that's clean. So I'm going to go get my blue thread locker. Right there. And you're going to put the spring on. I'm going to put this on. Remember, you've got to move this thing around so it lifts up and floats like that. And then we're going to take this blue Loctite. That's dirty. Got to have clean Loctite. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I'm just running out. That's barely enough. It's not quite thin enough. I do have some other somewhere. It just take me forever to find it. And then you take that nut. Try to figure out which one's the top. And you thread it on. Make sure that, that floating shim will lift which it does. And by hand you're going to snug that baby down. Remember that's aluminum. It doesn't have to be super tight. That's good. And there's your new base valve. So now what we're going to do is we're going to clean all this stuff, which I really don't want to do. That's the part I hate out of all this. I think my dad's here. He's going to borrow some tools, so I'm going to shut you off for just a minute, okay? Okay. Once all your parts are clean, uh, now I do have preferences on bushings and seals and kit stuff, but I'm going cheap on this one. And the reason I'm going cheap is all these O-rings. I, I save those because if they're not leaking, <laughs> I actually don't normally use them. Um, I'm going cheap because I'm probably going to have these apart a few times before I actually settle on what I'm going to settle on. I'm, I'm going to try this first valving and because the bike is mine and I don't have to wait for, you know, I don't have a customer waiting that wants it to... Uh, wants their stuff back right away. I can have some time to fiddle with things a little bit. So I'm probably going to, I don't know, I might just think it's good enough and keep it. I'm gonna sneeze. Okay, cleanliness. I always wanna make sure you keep your stuff clean best you can, okay? Um, I'm not going to take your time to do it, to spend all my time cleaning. Uh, I, am a fav uh, I am a fan of Maxima uh, fork oils. Um, they're by far the slickest, the most plush. I've tested several different ones. The uh, next one that comes close to it is the Honda brand fork oil. Um, I like it the most. So take a little dabble on your finger. I'm going to take this little piece right here. You want to lubricate the O-ring just a hair. That gets slid back in here like that. 
this little baby here. Goes down on the bottom. Sip to do da. And next thing we're going to do is we're going to get that over there like that. Is we're going to work on getting this stuff. I like to do this by hand. You can buy the bullets if you want to. These are 49 millimeter forks, so they tend to be um, they tend to be they're they're larger than the normal ones. So this is the top. I like to put the top down. You just have to remember the dust seal goes on first, and the dust seal. You have to think about the way it goes on the actual bike. The dust seal, when you get the fork upside right, it's gonna be like this, so it goes on upside down. I put the edge in and I gently kind of do this sort of thing, around, around, around. I'd never have trouble with the fork seals leaking, doing it that way. You can buy the bullet if you want to. It's very gentle. Sometimes you have to use, um, I'll put Teflon tape around it to get started. There we go. Where's the next thing? Okay, next thing's gonna be the clip ring. I think I have new clip rings in there. Yeah, it's whatever. Clip ring goes on, then you're gonna take the fork seal, not the dust seal, but the actual oil seal lubricate it, remember, um, which way the fork goes. On this one, the spring side goes up because the fork is upside down. Put it on the angle, give it a little love, and do a little gyro gyro to get it on. Don't force anything, just a little gentle gyro and it'll slide right on. Then we're gonna take the new washer, it goes on. And we're gonna lubricate the outer bushing. That goes on. Then the inner bushing, you see that bronze copper color? That's how you know they're new. And when a third of that is worn out, where you see a, because this is actually beveled, that surface is not flat, it's crowned. And so the pressure is on the inside center of the bushing. And when you get a third of that bushing worn down or more, it's time to replace them. Clip it in, ah, it actually fits. And then because I'm such a klutz, I always put the lid back on that. And then you can take the fork leg, get her started like so. Then I'll turn it upside down. And now, of course I forgot. Now, one of the things I don't like about aftermarket um, bushing kits is they make them too tight. And sometimes you have to file Sometimes you have to file the edges to loosen them up a little bit to get them in. We'll see how, how hard we've got to fight this one. Which one's my bent one? My bent one. I think this one's a good one. So we're going to get the bushings all the way down first. Slide that in. Oh, that went in nice. Didn't have to fight that at all. Didn't even have to use my tool. I am going to use my happy tool just to make sure that that's in all the way, which it is. Oh, one thing I neglected to mention is that you want to check your your slider, which is this part right here, and make sure there's no dings and problems with it. Um, no scratches and that kind of thing before you put it all together. And then, uh, this is part, sometimes I'll actually put that up there so it doesn't bother me. And this is a 48 millimeter seal slider, so it may not work, but, and then you're gonna give it a little love tap. Sometimes that bench is too, uh, too soft. When you hear that, it means that this is hitting the bottom. I 
I don't know, it might be in all the way. seals in but it's not in like I want it and I got one of these that's bent the other one is straight maybe this is the one that works better oh this one actually looks bent too about time for a new seal driver kit guys Okay, it's in, but I want to, sometimes I, I have to use a little extracurricular activity to make sure it's seated all the way. So I can see one edge is not quite down. I think I just need to get a new seal driver kit. That one's so well used. You could take a little piece of PVC pipe like that and just tap it. There, I heard it. Yeah, it's not quite there, it's close. What you're feeling for is make sure there's no stiction. It should drop like that with new bushings, new seals. Should drop and we're good. So now we'll take this little clip ring on. Use my favorite tool. Listen for the snap. There you go. I always will double check and make sure it's seated. That rotates. Still drops. Okay, good. Now we're going to put the dust seal on. I always try to do this by hand if I can't. Okay, there we go. That way we don't mess up that. Okay, still moves. That's good. All right. So that's good. Now what we're going to do is we are going to take the cartridge. Oh, still dripping stuff out of there. I did clean it, but it's got some stuff. Now, for those of you who want to know, there's a mid valve. We don't, I haven't changed the mid valve on these. I, I certainly can. I just, I haven't felt the need to, but this is what's called the mid valve. This is the compression side and it's just a float. And this is the rebound side. So if you need to change the rebound characteristics, it's this side towards the nut that you change. The compression side is a float because it's got the base valve that handles compression. Um, I'm not gonna change that yet because I've been able to get uh, where I wanna be with the clickers just fine with the rebound clickers. So we're gonna slide that down in and line it up inside the cone and it should look, hopefully I can keep this together, where you can see the threads on the bottom. Sorry, it's gonna all come, yeah, it's gonna all fall out if I do that. Ah, uh, crap, hang on. And what you're gonna do, 
So you're going to take your newly acquired base valve and you're going to not forget to put oil on the rubber. You've got a rubber deal there and here. Now you're going to put it in the bottom here and you're going to hand thread it. And then I like to give a little bit of pull on this and that helps to hold it still while you thread it in. I like to go as far, I can feel it pulling it in, what it feels like it is anyway. Now you can use a cartridge holding tool or if you're careful, you can just zip it. Don't hammer it home like it's the last thing that saves you from exile. Just give a little love, just a little tap tap roof. Sometimes you have to, it's spinning in there so. There you go. That's all you need. Now I'm down to like 60 pounds, so there's not a lot of pressure on that anyway. But that is all you need. Now this we're gonna throw away. I got a bunch of those as a spare anyway. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this upside right sure everything's clean and this little deal goes in with uh, collar up this thing goes down if I'm not mistaken down she goes and then you have this that goes in next and then um, the cool part about this is it's easy to um, there's two ways of measuring fork oil on this bike. Uh, one way, dang fly, is to uh, measure volume. The manual says 720 millimeter, 720 uh, cc's. So that's one way to do it. I always, if it, it gives you a volume, I always like that because I tend to prefer, it's really easy to do a volume. If, it, if you have to, if it gives you a distance, then you have to bleed all the air out and measure from the top down to the top of the fork oil. And it'll be like 100 millimeters or 80 or whatever. But this is 720. So this little thing has a 500 millimeter or 500 cc line, which is right there. So I'm gonna add that in first. Zip dee dee doo da. It's going to come probably close to the top. I'll have to bleed some air out of it. And you bleed the air by covering this with your thumb, kind of, because it'll squirt out. And you just go up and down. Now I can feel resistance. You can hear it even. Oh, there it goes, squirting out. Dang fly driving me crazy. And now I'm gonna add 220 more cc's because it was 720. So 500 plus 220 is 720. Now if you want to have more bottoming resistance, you can go 10 or 20 more cc's to 730 or 740. Totally okay. I'm gonna go with the stock because I can adjust it later after I mess with it for a while, but that's it. And then what we're gonna do is, this is a fun part. I'm gonna drag that dampening rod up. Back down, buddy. And now that there's resistance in there, you take that clean spring and you're going to drop it quick. 
like that. And then you're going to hold it by putting a bend on it. Put that, that, and you're going to thread that baby down. Okay, that holds your spring. Then you have a huge mess on your hands. Clean that off a little bit, and you're going to use your 11 millimeter. And use this wrench to hold the lock nut. And you use your, your 11 16 or your 17. You're going to snug that down. You don't want this to come apart, so give it a good little snuggaroo. Let go. And make sure things line up. Bring the fork leg up, and you're going to put the cap on. Now we're not going to tighten the cap till we get it back on the bike, but I've got some things I need to do before I do that. I'll show you in just a second. I probably won't take your time. Okay. That, my friends. It's rebuilt fork leg that's revalved. See how easy it is? This is the rebound setting. I like to go about, ah, I just make messes everywhere. That's my issue. Standing in this oil, making a mess. So usually on rebound, I'm going to start with this stock. Um, I'm going to go about 12 out. So this is rebound. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's out nine. So I'm going to go more. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12. That's my starting point. It's going to be a little more lively. That's okay. And then on the compression side, I firmed it up. So I'm going to see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Go to your first click, and that's where you start. No wonder it was so harsh. I'm going to go 14 out. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Okay. So I'd like to give it a once over here, make sure all the oil's off the dust seal so it doesn't collect dirt. I shake my head, it's because a stupid fly is just like sticking on me like stink on white rice, you know? Okay, so the fork leg is done. That fork leg is done. Now I'm going to put it back on the bike, but I'm not going to take your time, but I got to figure out these things that hold special clips. I got to clean these, get those back on. I uh, wish I could find new ones, but I'm struggling with that. Um, so I'll, I'm going to clean those up and put those back on. I'll put that back on the bike. The other leg is the same exact thing um, that you just saw. And so I'll get them all back on the bike and then I'm going to uh, show you how to align the front axle which is important. So, see you guys in a minute. Okay, both forks are pretty much, well not pretty much, they're back together. Uh, let's come back out here to the old bike a -roni. Sorry for the wind. Uh, we'll lean one, let's see. That one up against there. Um, we're gonna start out right fork leg get that baby back in there take her on home baby what we 
we're going to do is um, start out. Oh, hang on. I'm losing my microphone. Sorry, you guys. Sorry for the noise here for a second. There we go. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start out by putting this bleed screw on the top and I'm going to this first line, lining that up and then we're going to tighten these lower, what the heck am I doing? Oh no. I think my harbor freight rats, it's gone to crap. We're going to have to go ahead and use a torque wrench. Okay, so we're going to get that line marked, lined up again. The bleed hole at the top. Now we're going to start by snugging these lower fork triple clamp bolts down, and then we're going to torque them to 15 foot pounds. Good. Now why do I start with the lower ones? Because you want to snug up this top cap because it's hard to hang on to. So you just give a little snug and then you can tighten the top triple clamp fork bolts. And I have seen people clamp these babies down so tight that I literally I mean, people were stripping them trying to get them off, and they brought them to me because they were so tight they couldn't get them off. Now, you only need 15 foot-pounds. Once you go more than 15 foot-pounds, you start distorting the tube, and you just create more problems for yourself. On modern forks that are upside down, you can actually distort the tube enough that it will cause the forks to bind, and you can you can feel it. Um, let's see, let's get this other fork tube in. Let's slide that up. Try to get her lined up is always a little bit of a chore. Line that top to that top bleeder to the front. Line the line up. Oh crap! Of course, hit just right, and then you bump and move. Okay, I'm just gonna torque it down to 15 foot pounds, just the bottom one. And then we're gonna tighten the tighten that top uh, cap real quick, just a little snuggeroni. Not too much. I'm going to tighten the top ones down to 15 foot pounds. And that's it. I'll snug this back up. This is not the light I'm going to keep, by the way. This is just there to make it so. It doesn't look so hideous. I got other plans. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna turn the camera off for a little bit while I get these fork tube things all set back up the way they need to be. Um, I'll bring you back in just a minute. That's gonna take me some time. I'll get those all clamped up and then we'll 
button the rest up down here, okay? See you in a sec. Okay, guys, the front and gals, I should say, the front is pretty much back together enough to now put the front wheel back on. Now, I want to go through the alignment procedure. This works with pretty much every dirt bike, and this is really important. If you do it this way, you will not have binding and other issues related to your fork set up. And sometimes you can have a brand new suspension job done. Everything's dialed in perfectly, except for when you installed your front wheel, you didn't take note to avoid binding. And as a result, you have harsh front suspension. So this is the procedure. Brake caliper is off, so you don't have to mess around with the brakes right now. You pull your axle out. In this case, we have a speedometer that is gonna be a little bit of a pain because I finally routed the cable where it's supposed to go. And so I'm gonna get that aligned in here first. And then you're going to get the brake started. It's gonna be a little bit of a hassle here, sorry. It's normally you don't have a brake caliper to deal with. Okay, not a brake caliper, a speedometer, sorry. You get that started, don't forget you've gotta have your bushing. Now I would normally clean that, and I probably should clean it, but time right now. It's getting dark. I'm going to have this off again, I know. And you're going to run the axle through, get it started on the other side, and then you can take something soft, give it a little love tap, get her in there, straighten things out, get that axle in there. I usually have my um, Uh, my rubber mallet, but okay, there we go. Okay, first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to tap that axle in as far as it'll go. You're going to put the nut on here, and before you tighten that nut down, you're actually going to spread. I like to get that down pretty close. And then you're gonna spread these fork tubes apart to the degree that you can. The other thing you can do is you can tap this axle in, go as far as you can make it go. And you're gonna screw these down. So the nut is on the left side you're going to screw the right side down, but you're going to try to spread the forks apart to start with. Just follow me here for a minute. And you're going to tighten these down enough to hold that axle. I usually go almost to a full torque. Now, yes, you're right. We have bound up the forks because we're holding them apart. But follow me for just a minute here, okay? Then you're gonna to torque the nut down. You gotta have something to hold that axle so it doesn't spin. You can use a hex if you want to, but you basically can tighten those, this right side fork tube down. And then you're gonna tighten the nut, good and tight. And then you're gonna, this is now tied up against here. So now you're gonna to torque these two down. It's gonna be your left side, the nut side. You'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute. 15 foot-pounds. It's not that tight, really. And you're going to put your brakes on, your brake caliper. Boy, I need to spend some time attention cleaning these bolts and stuff. Weeds from last time we rode. Get 
these started. These don't have to be as tight as people make them either. I mean, you don't want your, for your brakes to fall off, but 15 foot-pounds is plenty. So let's zing those babies home. Okay, all right, now you remember we spread these things apart. So now we're gonna have to, we wanna line them up. So we're going to loosen these. That way that axle can move inside there wherever it wants to move, nice and loose. And you're going to take the bike back down. We're done with this jack now out of our way jack. You're going to take and grab the front brake. You're going to cycle the front forks. What that does is lines everything up. Then you're going to just come back over to that side. And you're going to torque this baby down. and everything should be lined up really good. There you go. Now I'm gonna kinda try to do something with this. Let's see. I'm not sure that's exactly how that's supposed to go, but I'm gonna start with it there. Tighten that down. Get this kind of straightened out. Tighten it down. I kind of like when you're dual sporting actually to have these boots. Now it sounds weird, but keeps all the grunge and the dirt out. And I don't know how it's gonna be. I'm gonna have to see here. I don't have a, I don't have a bolt and nut for this yet. I'm gonna have to go find one, but let's, Spend some time loosening this up, straighten it out. Not bad for the girls I'm going with on this thing, huh? Wendy. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find me Uh, something that I can bolt into there to hold it. I'll be back in just a minute. But there she be. Um, essentially, front forks are done. Taken apart, cleaned, new bushings, new seals, and a revalve. Yes, it takes several hours to do, but you do it once, it's gonna last for a long time. So uh, don't forget to align your forks up so that they're not bound, and that will help you a lot to keep your front forks nice and plush. Anyway, thanks for hanging out, guys and gals. And we've got the rear shock to do, and then we're gonna go out and do a test and tune, suspension setup, meaning clickers, and this bike will be pretty much ready just to roll from there on out. Anyway, thanks guys.